you guys hear me okay? Yeah, this works. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank everybody in uniform for your service. Uh, this is a very uh, humbling opportunity for me to be here uh, and stand in front of so many people that are deciding to, um, uh, to serve in the military. At the same time, it is a very, uh, um, I'm pretty nervous being up here. I'm not a public speaker. I don't have a message uh, that, I, that I go around and, and spread out there. When, when so many people are looking at me, I either have to block a guy here, here, or here. And uh, today I have to talk about the, the delicate topic of leadership uh, and ethics uh, as a 330-pound offensive lineman in the NFL. So <laughs> not an easy task. So I was thinking about uh, the topics, you know, something that I could, that I could some message that I can give you. Um, and obviously we have, we have a lot in different. You guys are going to fly planes and, and take care of, uh, uh, you know, the Air Force. And, and I was in the Army. And so um, I thought about what, what, what would I tell my little brother, my little sister, uh, as they were going into this this journey of the profession of arms. Uh, what kind of lessons could I give them uh, that would help them become better leaders? And so I thought of this, this interesting story that I've been thinking for the past couple of years of my life. Um, it englobes a lot of the challenges that you face as, as, as an officer, and, uh, and it also um, you know, describes some of the challenges of the new warfare in the war in Afghanistan that might be very unfamiliar uh, to some of you. Uh, but before I continue with this, uh, this story, I need a volunteer. Um, any, any Pittsburgh Steelers out here in the fans? Okay, sir. You've now been promoted to second lieutenant, the 10th Mountain Division. You need to pay attention because I want to ask you, you know, this story. But obviously, as an academy grad, I got some, some lesson objectives uh, for this brief. Uh, I would like you guys to understand <laughs> the importance of, of personal values when it comes to making critical decisions, uh, how important it is the academy and the academy experience, some of the challenges of today's warfare, and finally, to get familiar with some of the Army terminology and tactics that would be useful for you in your careers. Okay, so in 2011, uh, when I was a senior, um, President Obama came to the United States Military Academy to announce the new uh, strategy in the war in Afghanistan. And, and to me, I felt, um, you know, I feel extremely honored, obviously, that the Commander-in-Chief was given his now the mission as I was going to graduate and become an infantry officer, essentially hear his words and take him down to the battlefield. Uh, you know, we're going to take Hellman and Kandahar, we're going to surge with 30,000 troops, and we're going to get out of there in 18 months and wrap everything up. So, seven months after graduation, I was in the middle of a 12-month deployment. And uh, for me, as an infantry officer, as somebody who went to West Point, I couldn't envision a better job. I mean, even today, I'm an NFL player making millions, and if you gave me the opportunity to go back and be a platoon leader for 10th Mountain Division uh, in 2010, 2011, in the middle of the war, I would take that in a heartbeat. Uh, it, was, it was truly an honor and, and, and truly an experience that, that I cannot, um, cannot explain to you in words, you know, in, in this brief. Think about the excitement of Lieutenant Dan, you know, in the movie uh, Forrest Gump. That's honestly how we all felt. It's not just me, but my classmates as well. The problem is that I didn't go to an easy place. Uh, we got sent to Kandahar province, which was a very, um, you know, problematic area. We got sent to the, uh, the, the Zari district, which was the home of the Taliban. Uh, the home of Mullah Omar. And uh, as you can see uh, in the, uh, the two graphics, uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of SIG acts in the air. There was a lot of enemy activity in the city of, uh, of Sandre, where I, was, where I was stationed or serving. And, um, and obviously, it was not easy for me. But the good thing is that I had a tremendous group of, of soldiers that I served with, the best soldiers and NCOs that I could have ever dreamed of. And these guys took care of me. Because I only had three months of experience, two months of experience being a platoon leader when I started seeing bullets fly next to me. And um, even though I was prepared, I was not ready. You know, there's a very, there's a slight difference there between, you know, knowing what you're going to do and how you're going to do it uh, when the time comes. Um, you know, I think just like in football and just like everything's happened in my life, my success is dependent on, on the people around me and, and how, how they've taken, uh, you know, my career and, 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 and how professional they've been uh, helping their, their officers. And the infantry depend exclusively uh, on, on NCOs. If, if, if you don't get along with them, if you are not a respectful platoon leader and you don't understand your responsibilities, then you're definitely going to fail. And so in my case, they helped me out. I mean, I, I just can't, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine what it would have been like if, if they had not had that attitude towards me. If my gear was messed up, they fixed it. If I was making a wrong decision, they'd give me a warning. And they were always extremely professional to not call me out or put me in situations where I would fail. So I felt extremely fortunate to have them. On top of that, there were warriors that really cared about the infantry, that really cared about the 10th Mountain Division being grunts. You know, you can picture them, you know, Marines, infantry officers. I mean, it was, it was, it was a crazy environment and a crazy culture to be part of. 
everybody wanted to go out and give it all for each other. Everybody wanted to, you know, step out and, 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 and do, you know, crazy things under fire to make sure that we, we had each other's backs. And, um, and I was very fortunate to be in that. Obviously, I, I assimilated that culture. I embodied that culture. I started smoking cigarettes and dipping like them, you know, to, to sort of fit in and, and be part of this, you know, this, uh, this crazy experience. And, um, you know, it was, it, it was, a, it was a very humbling uh, uh, opportunity for me. As you can see right there on the map, that's the, 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 the district uh, that we're in charge of. That's mostly Kandahar province. You can see the red desert right there. It's actually really cool. Looks like, you know, giant dunes like the movie Aladdin. And to the left, we got uh, Helmand province, which was obviously a very conflictive area. Uh, Eastern Zari was uh, where, I was, where I was serving in the city of Sandra. So, got there in uh, March time frame. I did not have a platoon. Uh, you know, I got there a little bit late. I had to finish up my ranger school, airborne school, so I was a little bit frustrated. But a couple months into my deployment, a uh, platoon leader got hurt, and they sent me in to fill in for him. We started conducting operations. Our main mission was to secure the people of Zari District and everything that we did. And in the process, we had to train the ANA and the AMP to make sure that they could uh, support themselves in the future. Um, Started with a lot of missions, obviously clearing NAIs, natural area of interest, and then target compounds where we thought, you know, we had Taliban presence, uh, historic cache sites. Um, if, the, if we had any intel of, of, of Taliban members, we always went to their house, clear them, big, big time clearance operations, and we always went with the ANA and the AMP to make sure that they were, you know, learning how to do missions so we can leave at some point. March time frame, it was, it was very cool. You know, we got a couple IDs here and there. We got a couple firefighters here and there. Everybody gets their CIB, get all the awards. Everybody's really happy. And then we start getting into the fighting season. We start getting into the, the May, June, July, August time frame. The Ramadan. Uh, most of the, the insurgents come from, from Pakistan. They cross the border. They cross the Red Desert in motorcycles. They get their orders from their subcommanders, and they start fighting us. And it all starts with a couple of firefights here and there. Then. You know, a and &E &P gets hurt, and then you start getting U.S. casualties in your platoon. And so in, in our case, and first, uh, first platoon, Alpha Company, 287, 3rd uh, Brigade Combat Team, 10th Mount Division, we started getting, you know, casualties pretty frequently. So we accumulated, you know, probably eight casualties up until, you know, the point of the story, and the, the morale of the platoon was, was, was going down. I mean, it was... It was very easy to brief the mission the first time because everybody was really excited to go out, you know, get out of the wire, do a couple missions, and it's really cool to get in the first couple firefights and whatnot, but then you start seeing a casualty, right? And then you're just like, all right, the next mission, we're going to do it for him. We're going to go out there, we're going to do it for him. And then you get two casualties, and you say, we're going to do it for them. And then you get four casualties, it's like, you know, we're going to honor them, but then it becomes, it becomes difficult. It becomes very challenging because when a private is asking you, sir, why are we doing this mission? At first, it's really easy to say, hey, you know what, we need to secure the country, we need to uh, provide security for, for the people so they can start getting uh, their economy going, so they can start providing security for themselves. And the big picture is that we need to prevent, you know, further attacks from Al-Qaeda and prevent more 9-11s. Um, but the problem is that we're not really seeing any objectives. It's not like World War II when we're going to Berlin and we have a shorter distance every day. This is, this is very challenging. This is us going out there clearing NAIs, clearing ID fields, and then the next day we find more ID, um, you know, planted in the same locations. This is we clear a compound, we clear a village, and the next day they're just fighting from the same village. And it's very frustrating. And it's very frustrating when you get in a lot of casualties. And so from my platoon, it got to a point in the middle of the fighting season where, um, you know, everybody was really, it was really, really, it was really tough to motivate them uh, to believe in the mission. So this specific day, I think it was uh, August 24th, 2011, um, my commander uh, called me into the, the, the talk and he said, hey, we have a, um, we have an Afghan uh, a and slash teacher at a, at a local school who has some intel on a, um, uh, this, this Taliban member called Ali Ahmad. And Ali Ahmad escaped from Sarposa uh, a couple of months before. It was a, it, this made the news, it was a huge story. This is Chapo before El Chapo. I mean, 500 dudes through a tunnel escaped. This guy, Ali Ahmad, considered a Taliban subcommander, has 15, 16 guys. Goes back to his, um, goes back to his, to, his, to his house, and he notices that in this school that we built, we put an A and P checkpoint to protect it. So he simply walked into the school, 
with his, you know, with his boys and his guns, and he said, hey, listen, you know, you got to get out of here. Man, I'm back in town. You know, this is my town, you know, sort of deal. And I guess one of the AMP guys, you know, did not really like that. You know, they got in a little altercation, and it was like, you know, you got 24 hours to get out of here. So in that period of time, he calls uh, the interpreter from our cop, from Cop Sandra, you guys saw it up top, and then uh, you know, he said, hey, listen, I know where this guy lives. He's been a Taliban commander for a while. He was arrested and escaped from Sarposa, and I can take you to his house. So for us, that signified you know, progress. That is, wow, look at this. The AMP is taking you know, their own intel. They can carry out this, this mission. We're going to go out there and support them. We're going to go out there and get this Yali Ahmad. What was really interesting about uh, Pierre Muhammad School is that it was a school uh, that, that made headlines in Time Magazine because a company commander from 4th ID just down the road in Fort Carson uh, came down to the school and, and observed the situation and decided to open up the school and teach secular education in a Sharia law uh, environment. And that was, that, was, that was obviously a huge sign of progress for us, but for the Taliban it was a slap in the face because we were teaching math and we were teaching Arabic and we were teaching, um, you know, uh, you know, non-religious things in the heart of, uh, you know, the, the, where the Taliban uh, originated. It was a very difficult challenge for Fourth ID to open up the school, but they were able to do it. That's where they wrote the article. But the, you know, the units that came after that were not able to open up the school. And that's where my unit came down there. They opened up the AMP checkpoint, and we tried to man the school as best we could. Must note, uh, you know, here a little bit of the DAO. Uh, we had phase line mariners. Phase line mariners is, is, was nothing more than a dried wadi, a dried riverbed that was really deep. It was probably as deep as these lights around me. And it had a lot of water in the spring, in the fall, but in the summertime, it just you know, completely dried out. All of the contact and all of the uh, enemy encounters happened in what we call the green zone. So it's nothing more than orchard fields that were extremely difficult to maneuver, uh, grape fields, and, and, and huge huts that provided you know, the enemy with plenty of, of, of cover and concealment to attack large elements that were really slow to maneuver like ours because we always had to have the a a with us and we had to leave during the day, which was extremely challenging. So phase line mariners divided the AO. It was utilized by farmers all the time as they got to their fields. And uh, in our case, it was a very conflictive area that we really didn't really like uh, to go down there. So. Before I begin, I've got to give you a little bit of background of how Army units uh, clear a compound. Um, this is very, very basic, and it's, it's, you know, it's not a top secret. I'm not giving you know, top secret information here. Uh, but usually, the way we do it is we do isolation, containment, and assault in that order. So if you want to isolate the enemy from coming into your compound, into your operation, you want to contain the enemy from coming out, and then finally, you want to assault it. So if, you know, this is a, a, somewhere at the academy. I picked this from Google, Google Maps, uh, but you would just Pick locations where you think the enemy's going to come in. You isolate the compound, you contain it, and then you finally uh, clear the, the compound. In the Army, obviously, we would not use uh, you know, those, those little soldiers. We would use tactical mission graphics uh, with, with representations of the units that are going to be out there, and the mission would look something like this. But for the purpose of this presentation, I would just use uh, common graphics so you guys can understand it. So when I came down to the compound, um, the target compound with a star, I, lo I, I place an isolation element uh, comprised of uh, an AMP element and a U.S. Uh, soldier. I had one team, you know, playing left tackle and having my back, you know, as we were coming to the compound. And then we finally, uh, I sent an assault team, you know, of three or four guys to clear, clear the compound. We had to take two squads. Uh, that was usually our element. Two squads is roughly 18 guys in a, an ideal scenario. But with casualties and leave, that number goes down to roughly about 15, 16. So I have 16 guys on the ground and four AMP. When I was conducting the clearance of the compound, um, you know, went inside and did the typical uh, you know, tactical questioning. Hey, do you know Ali Ahmad? Yes. Um, is he here? No. Is he a Taliban? No. OK, where is he? Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's the level of proficiency that I had in my tactical questioning back then. Um, and as I was conducting you know, my search, we started finding you know, single rounds here and there, you know, a magazine. And we knew that, obviously, we were in the right place, but obviously, it was not going to be there. It's very difficult unless you come in at night you know, with the Rangers uh, and give them a little surprise to be able to catch uh, a target you know, at, their, at their place. Um, but as I was conducting this clearance, um, a motorcycle came out from an alleyway. And 
the a and opened fire and shot the motorcycle. And it was roughly 50 meters south of the compound. Around a bend, we couldn't really see. So it was very challenging. Um, we went outside and I asked the US soldier, hey man, what happened? They say, sir, saw a motorcycle come up and this guy right here just grabbed his PKM and just opened fire on him. And I said, well, was he a Taliban? Did he have anything on him? I said, no, sir, I couldn't see anything. So then I looked at this, this AMP soldier and I said, hey, what were you doing? I said, sir, you know, I thought it was a Taliban. And obviously through a translator. Now let me give you a little background about the AMP in Afghanistan. It's pretty impressive what they do. I mean, these guys are always extremely high on heroin or other drugs, and we have to take them out on you know, 20 mile walks in 110 degree weather. So that's impressive. Um, but obviously their competence is very, very low. Um, the, the people don't like them uh, because they usually uh, mistreat the, the general population. They have power that's been given to them through us, uh, and it does not you know, form part of the, the hierarchy that they have in the village. And so people don't really like to deal with the AMP. And in this case, I was dealing with, obviously, you know, for the, 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 the lowest, um, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a, a more, uh, I don't know if there's worse to describe, you know, just, just, just the, type of, the type of people that, that joined the AMP, unfortunately. And this guy, you know, fired his weapon uh, at an adult male that was coming up to our location. So, that moment, my company commander heard the shots and got on the radio and he said, um, hey, 1-6, this is 6, are you in contact? I said, hey, no, sir. Uh, this, this, you know, we're, we're conducting the clearance uh, when an adult male came up, uh, up phase line Mariners, and uh, the AMP element outside the compound just opened fire and, you know, took him down. We have no eyes over it. And I said, okay, stand by. At that moment, uh, my company commander, who's extremely competent, who's a West Point guy all over the place, loved being a company commander, was you know, very thoughtful about absolutely everything that happened in the battlefield, uh, understood that this could be a potential civilian casualty situation. So it's CCIR, uh, critical commander's information requirement, uh, passed that up to battalion, passed that up to brigade, and he came over the radio and he said, hey, 1-6, go find the status of the adult male. This is now... Um, you know, you've got to conduct BDA, you know, we can define it, we have a civilian casualty uh, at our hands. Um, you know, for some reason, you know, it, it, you know, 50 minutes have gone by, you know, from the time that I got the, you know, we hear the shots until now, and I come chatter, start going crazy. I come chatter is nothing more than, you know, if you were a kid and you had a walkie-talkie, you know, you can hear the cops, you know, on the frequency and whatnot. So we're hearing a lot of chatter about, you know, hey, I see them, we're looking at them, they're there, you don't know if it's, you know, related to you or if it's to another unit that's, you know, three, four miles, you know, outside the valley. But, but the ICOM shutters start picking up during this time. So I told my entire platoon to come back inside the compound, set up security, and just wait for the commander and see what we had to do. Um, when I understood that I had to do this movement, I wanted to see, you know, what the conditions were for me. So I said, hey, do we have any assets? You know, do we have any, any A-10s, you know, that might be on station, any, any pink teams of Apaches and Kiowas that are flying over the area? And he said, negative. I mean, everybody, and you know, you gotta understand that this is, this is our district in the middle of the summer. Everybody's getting shot at, everybody's being in a firefight. You know, my, my, my platoon is, no, is not special. So they said, hey, conduct, conduct this BDA and come back. So at this moment, uh, usually the way, I, the way it worked uh, for, 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 for myself and for most officers, you know, you get the mission, you present it to your NCOs, and the NCOs develop a plan on how you're gonna accomplish that, and you're obviously responsible for everything your platoon does or fails to do and you approve it, you know, or, or deny the plan, and you work another way. And, um, you know, when I turned to my squad leaders, um, you know, they were all kind of not trying to make eye contact with me. They were, they were trying to uh, process the situation. Um, you know, this is, this is not an unusual mission for us. We've done these, you know, we do these every single day. We move through contact every single time. But at this moment, we were, you know, eight casualties deep into the deployment. It's 12 months long. And our mission right now is to check whether a guy is dead or alive. And it's down phase line Mariners, which we know is a very dangerous place. And we know that the ICOM chatter is going crazy. We know we don't have, you know, a lot of people to swarm the entire valley. We just have 16 guys. And one of my squad leaders, actually my best squad leader, I trusted this guy with my life, taught me most of the things that I knew uh, as an infantry platoon leader. He looked at me and he said, hey, sir, um, don't, don't send us down there. 
you know, and I, and I had the type of relationship with my, my soldiers where we were extremely close. You know, I live, in, you know, I live with these guys. You know, it's not like I, you know, we lived in this big base. You know, we have a very small base. Uh, we had to build everything that was around our base. Uh, so like an OP, and we were essentially, you know, living together every single day. And, um, and they knew that if, you know, they could have an honest conversation with me, I was not going to turn to a, you know, I was not going to, you know, rage and, and, and go up in arms. This, is, this was a serious situation. This was a, you know, sir, please. Please don't, don't make us do this. No, no, I could have, you know, obviously said, hey, of course, you're going to do this. You know, you're going to go down, the, you're going to go down this alleyway. But I started feeling myself like there was a lot of doubt, you know, behind uh, what we were doing, you know. And there's no shame in that. This guy right here, you can't really see him. His name was Haji Lala. Um, he's his profile picture. This is the only one I can find, but he kind of looks like Quavo if you were born after uh, 1990. And um, he was in charge of the AMP. He was, uh, he was a warlord of the area, and, and when, we, when we came in in Afghanistan, especially in Zarya district, we, we, we made a lot of pacts with warlords so they can provide a lot of the security. But not every warlord could, uh, could say that they were exclusively helping U.S. forces. There's no way you can survive if you just, you know, allied with the U.S. Uh, in this 18-year in this war. Uh, these guys, this guy was playing, you know, sort of both sides. In uh, November of 2010, he was actually responsible for a uh, suicide attack in Takap Sandre, you can actually look it up on YouTube, um, where two U.S. soldiers lost their lives. And so a lot of the units were, uh, that came after the, the, the 101st were always debating whether they should take Haji Lala down or not, because he had a lot of alliances with, uh, with some people that, that obviously were trying to harm us. Also, uh, this picture was found at the Pier Muhammad School uh, in some kid's backpack. Um, you know, we, we thought that we were, uh, you know, grabbing all these taxpayers' dollars, buying all these back book bags and notebooks and teaching the kids, you know, to liberate them. You're obviously a, a cute Afghan kid and, you know, melts your heart, you know, that, that you're really helping them. And a lot of organizations were helping us to, to open up the school. It was a huge uh, OER, you know, bullet point for, for every single uh, field grade officer uh, that came to the Zari district. But that was the reality on the ground. If you can see that first vehicle, that's actually a Husky. It was a part of the route clearing package that we use around Zara District. And not too far away from Pier Muhammad School, we suffered, well not we, because I was not a part of the route clearing, uh, route clearing package, but the task force suffered casualties because they kept getting blown up. We have to go five miles an hour and clear all the roads so that we can conduct operations. The second vehicle is a Max Pro. It was, you know, a couple of Max Pros got blown up very close to the area as well. And you got some Rokola's rifles, RPGs, and RPKs that were the weapons of the choice uh, in Zara District at the time. And you can see the last picture. You have an IED command wire with a battery and some, you know, Taliban with a turbine, you know, about to set it off. So that was really frustrating. You know, we knew that the mission, uh, even though it looked really good on paper, um, you know, at the time we, we felt like we were not really making an advance. If you look at, you know, 2018, you look at today, you look at a map of what the Taliban controls, the entire city of Sandra is controlled by the Taliban. The entire province of Helmand is controlled by the Taliban. So as I was trying to decide what to do, whether to listen to my guys, whether to, um, you know, like how, we're gonna, how am I going to approach this indecisiveness? How am I going to approach this, this lack of motivation or this, or, this, or this crucial ethical dilemma? My company commander got on the radio and said, hey, what's the delay? What's the status of the, uh, of the adult male? And I try to stall, I try to convey this, this sort of uh, sense of urgency by asking, hey, did you guys get any ICOM chatter on your, on your side? You know, are you, are you seeing any other inter information that's going to help me accomplish this mission? I was trying to make a bigger deal out of it. But my commander was running out of patience. And so he said, hey, listen, uh, well, you know, what's the delay on this? You know, your mission right now is to find the status of the adult male. Do you copy over? And that's essentially, you know, in the radio how you yell at somebody. And then when you're a lieutenant, you say, uh, Roger, good copy, as acknowledging that you're being yelled at by your superior officer. And so at this moment, you know, the, the sense of urgency started to grow in, in this decision. And so we, we try to have a couple conversations, you know, between the squad leaders, we try to call the, you know, the, the assets that we had, you know, nothing. You know, my squad leader is saying, sir, do you really want to risk the life of one of your guys to go down this, this, this dry wadi and figure out whether the guy is dead or alive? Is it worth the life of one of your soldiers? Under these circumstances, after this, 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 this AMP guy who's still, you know, riding his high wave and can barely look at me straight in the face, um, you know, is, is responsible for all this. 
So it was at this moment where you know, we're having this little huddle and I'm having a conversation with myself in this, in this, in this compound that, that one, of my best squad lead, one of my best team leaders came up to me and he said, hey, sir, um, you know, you can get on the radio and you can tell the commander that we went down there and we saw the motorcycle and there was nothing. And none of us are going to say anything. So, PL, what do you do? I'm going to give you a little bit of background. If you decide to go down the alleyway, you could, you cannot get shot at. You know? Obviously, the ICOM shadow doesn't mean that they're in your vicinity. You have no assets. You have nothing, you know, nothing to be afraid of. Technically, you've been doing this mission for a long time. But your guys are telling you right now that this mission is done. You understand that the mission is obviously not accomplished. You're not rescuing a, a, a platoon of, of you know, a different unit that's been cut off by the enemy. You're not even saving a a school full of children. You're verifying whether a man is dead or alive. If somebody gets killed, how is that going to affect your trust next time you go on a mission, right? You go on a mission, you say, hey, the sir is a company man. You know, he's not really looking out for us. He's not really one of us. You got to go back to the cop and you got to answer. You got to look all your soldiers in the face. And every, every soldier is going to talk to each other and, and, and explain them exactly what's happening in that compound. And they all know the mission. I, know, I understand you know, what we're doing. Right? You got this good order and discipline that you have to maintain because you're, you're obviously an officer and you have your rank, but you also have your guys and put them at, at risk. If you don't do these, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you obey and you lie to your commander, obviously you have to face the consequences of that. Um, and if you don't accomplish the mission, you're probably going to get fired and you know, face UCMJ. So what do we do? It's very tough. Okay. Okay. That's a very good, that's a very, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's very natural to every single person, right? It really is. But unfortunately, that's a challenge that everybody's facing in Afghanistan. And it's not just me. I'm not special. All my classmates were facing this. Everybody in Zara District is facing this. Every battalion commander is facing this when they get a mission. The thing is that this is a, a cool scenario because you can add a couple of factors like the Pierre Mahmoud School. I got that little picture, and obviously, uh, we know now what's been happening over the years um, you know, with, with the war in Afghanistan. Um, so I'll tell you what I did. All right, I'll tell you guys the, the thought process that I had during this, this, this whole uh, operation. The first thing that I thought about was the reason why I joined the military. So I think I shared with, with some of you uh, that I was, uh, was raised in Rota Naval Station in uh, southern Spain. It's a, uh, it's a base uh, that was utilized by Marines and by Army uh, personnel to transport uh, uh, U.S. forces from, from the United States to Afghanistan. Um, I grew up dying to be a Marine. I wanted to be a Marine so bad. You know, I wanted to go into the gym and do nothing but curls, you know, get a nice haircut and get my, my, my dog tags and walk around like I belong to a pack of wolves. I really wanted to do that so badly, you know. Um, but unfortunately, when I got, did my physical, um, I couldn't see the number on the screen. I don't know if you guys can see the number on the screen, but apparently there's a number on the screen. Um, and that's sort of the physical test that they do uh, to determine if you're, if you're called blind or not. I see a couple heads shaking, I, you know. You guys would have not been able to be Marines either way. Um, so I failed this test and I had to go to West Point. And I went to West Point, it was the best decision I've made in my entire life. Loved the place, uh, met my best friends, and I truly started to get a sense of what it took to be an officer and the sort of things that I was gonna do. And when I went to West Point, I found out uh, sort of the, the, the framework uh, that, that, that the cadets operate uh, and sort of the, the, sort of the rules and the little, the little dilemmas that we have to face as cadets all the time. And the honor code was, was a really interesting, uh, you know, writing on the wall, um, obviously. Cadet would not lie, cheat, steal, tell those who do. I heard that they, they stole the, the steel uh, at the Air Force Academy. I thought it was pretty funny. <coughs> But obviously, when you're a cadet and you show up, you say, look, I'm not going to put myself in this situation. I don't want to deal with honor boards. I don't want to be in one of these rooms. I don't want you know, God to look down at me and tell me whether I'm you know, guilty or innocent. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to steal. But what about tolerating those who do? That is a tough one. Don't tell me that's not a tough one. That's a very tough one. You know, we, I remember you, know, you can have these conversations all day at the academy, whatever academy you go to. And at the end of the day, you're never going to have the, the, the solution of uh, 
of what to do when your best friend, your roommate, you know, maybe doesn't document you know, well enough because you guys don't want to all get caught on the, the scheme of copying the same problem set uh, from the smartest guy in the class and you guys are trying to you know, confuse the teacher and the instructor by using different, different sources and whatnot. Um, and it's very difficult. I mean, I, I don't know if, I don't know if, if, I don't know if you're going to turn in your, your, your best friend, you know, for something like this. It's a very, very difficult, um, you know, part of the, the honor code that you have to deal with. When I was actually doing research for this, for this, for this presentation, I looked at the Navy uh, honor code, and they don't have that last part. They just have a cadet will not light, sheet steel, and they go into a little bit about each one of them, but they don't have the last part. Um, but I thought in my, in my experience, it gave me a framework. It gave me something to think about. And whether it was the conversations about what do you do when your roommate lie, uh, cheats or you know, copies a test or you know, does something you know, wrong, you know, what is it that you're going to do about it? Um, and I felt like you know, that, was, that, is, that is a necessary conversation you have to have with yourself. It's not the first time in Afghanistan that I saw this. And then you have to have uh, the conversation with the voices in your head, right? And I'm not the only one. Everybody does it. Uh, when I'm playing football on Sundays and it's... You know, third down and long, and we're down by three, or we're down by seven, and we have to tie, and we're doing the two-minute drill. You know, as I get in my stands, I can hear the voice of my coach talk in my head. You know, I got to go against a guy like Von Miller, the guys like, like Terrell Suggs. Those guys love young tackles uh, in two-minute drill, and I can hear my voice in my head saying, hey, Al, you know, don't screw this up. You know, don't screw this. The game is on the line right now. They're coming after you. Um, you know, when you do your set, make sure you set vertical. Make sure you set vertical because usually tackles like to open up their hips against speed rushers and he might come inside. If he does come inside, make sure your inside hand is strong. When he does, make sure you get a good grip of him, right? Because the play might get extended a little bit long. Ben Roethlisberger likes to hold the ball a little bit longer. So make sure you, you, make sure you protect like an extra couple seconds uh, for Ben to allow him to make a play. Well, when I was an officer, I had the same voices in my head. And there were actually instructors that I had at the academy. Um, I had Major Duraki, who was a, a combat engineer and my civil engineer professor, and I had uh, Colonel Brown, who's now the first Ranger Battalion commander down in Savannah, Georgia. And he was a uh, uh, psychology for leaders instructor uh, when I was a cadet. I was a football player. Football players were not the most popular uh, players uh, at the academy. Uh, we had a, a somewhat of a reputation. I understand that the cross country team has the same reputation here at the academy now, uh, the Air Force Academy. And uh, he was the first one that opened up my eyes. You know, I was, I was determined to go, you know, I, I, Air defense, artillery, fear of defense, you know, just do my five years and get out, you know, I'm not really interested in, in the whole army thing, but, but he challenged me. He said, you know, that's crazy. You know what I mean? That's crazy that, uh, um, you know, you have so much talent, so much potential, you know, you want to do so many great things, and you're not going to do that right now. So I started having a conversation in this compound with, with both, you know, Colonel DeRocky and uh, Colonel Brown, and then they both first agreed. I was like, hey, you're not going to lie. You're not going to lie. You're not going to lie to your commander. You lie to your commander, you're going to get in a slippery slope. Uh, where your soldiers are going to hold you hostage. And essentially, they're going to be able to tell you what to do every single time. And there's no turning back. So I'm not going to lie. At the same time, I understand that this mission could end someone's life. And I'm going to have to face um, you know, the mother or, or sons of the service member. Um, and I'm going to have to go out there and, uh, and explain them why their husband is not coming back home. And when they grow up and they give me a call, I'm going to have to tell them you know, that their father died in a mission where we're checking a motorcycle. Um, that's, that's pretty tough. So I was not going to ask um, you know, my guys to do something. And so what I ended up doing was just look at my platoon and say, hey, listen, I'm going to go down here by myself. If anybody wants to come down with me, you can come down with me. One NCO said, all right, sir, let's go. And I'll try to make this quick. We're talking about 50 yards. You know, there's kids in the combine right now. They're going to do this, you know, this 50 yards in less than five seconds. Um, but for some reason, it just looks like it's the most dangerous thing that I'm about to do in my life. And we've, done, we've been doing this for the entire deployment. It's just the matter that we're looking at a motorcycle. That is, that, is, that is the mission that we have ahead. So we stepped out of the compound, and you know, not even 50 meters outside the compound. Uh, you know, we had the AMP, the four AMP guys on heroin, you know, leading the, 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 the movement. Uh, two RPGs came down off on the tree line. They peppered. The, the AMP, I guess they missed, and then we got into a firefight. I started running back to the compound as fast as I could. I thought I was running a solid four, two, five. In reality, I was probably more like a, you know, six, six and a half. <laughs> Bullets are flying next to me. I'm saying, I can't believe they're missing so many shots. These guys are terrible shooters. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and I'd, you know, I'd, you know, I'd slow motion, jump into the ground, get behind cover, throw a grenade. I'm thinking, I can't believe I'm about to throw a grenade. Threw it like a baseball, exactly how they tell you not to throw a grenade, tore my shoulder out, <laughs> got into the compound, and then we got into a firefight that lasted, you know, an hour or so, called the A-10s, you know, they did some gun runs, you know, and we never got to check the motorcycle. I guess the interesting thing about this situation is that you can make a lot of parallel comparisons to what happened when I got uh, left out in the, uh, in the, the tunnel uh, for the national anthem. Uh, none of these things were heroic. I don't consider myself a hero, even though a lot of the media, uh, you know, especially the conservative media, wants to portray me as a hero. Uh, I think when I saw myself in Breitbart News, uh, I almost went out and said that I was a legal immigrant, so they would leave me alone. <laughs> but. Uh, but it's not a tough, it's, it's a very tough spot because I, I was not trying to do, I was not trying to, be, you know, heroes are, you know, the, the, the guys that come pick up casualties, you know, from dust off, you know, when they know, they have no idea, absolutely no idea how bad it's down there. A platoon leader is obviously trying to get a good HLZ, but clearly there's no break from the Taliban and they know that, that they have a casualty and they have to land in hot HLZ. That's a hero. Hero is a guy that's been holding up uh, a gun position, you know, so his guys can live knowing he's going to fully die. I was trying to say, um, you know, what would, what would the leaders, what would the, 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 the an academy grad would do in this situation? Uh, can I live with myself? Can I live with myself if I lie to my commander? Can I live with myself if I tell my guys to go down there? And I guess, you know, in this environment, in this beautiful building at the Air Force Academy, it seems pretty easy, but it's a very tough conversation to have with yourself. I mean, I don't know, obviously, all the details, but you can make a lot of comparisons, um, you know, to the fear that the police officer felt in Florida when he was waiting outside the school when they were shooting, and he was outside for four minutes. And it's really easy for people to point the finger and say, you know, I should have gone inside or whatnot. But when you start hearing the bullets, when you start hearing people scream, when you start hearing you know, the impact, it's, it's, it's very unnatural. It's extremely unnatural to, to make a move like that. But in my mind, I knew that I wanted to go to the military academy because I wanted to serve as an infantry officer more than anything else in the world. I wanted to be Lieutenant Dan, leave me out on the battlefield, let me die, because I don't want to ever consider uh, you know, being an embarrassment for my family or being an embarrassment to all those that raised me. So, to recap, um, understanding the importance of critical decision uh, the, when, it, you know, when it comes to your, to your values. Everybody here has a different set of values. Everybody here comes from a different hometown, different background. Everybody here has a different story and, and, and a reason why they got here. Uh, your leadership style is going to come at a cost. Your leadership style I was the ultimate bro of the football team. I was always really fun to be around. I was always, uh, you know, very close to my guys. But when it came down to make a decision what I had to put their, their lives at risk, I struggled with that. I struggled tremendously uh, because that was a very conflictive area um, in the way I was brought up. And everybody here has a lot of values that are going to conflict with the military values that the academy or the, the military is going to try to instill in you. And then obviously, a lot of times, you know, we have to balance between you know, a good option and a bad option, and it's a matter of finding which one's the good one and which one's the bad one. But what if you have two bad options and you have to make a decision, you have to get creative, and you have to, you know, do what's best, um, you know, for you, the mission, and your men. Understand how the academy uh, develops young leaders. Obviously, the honor code helped me tremendously. My instructors helped me tremendously. But I'll also tell you this. There was a writer uh, for the Washington Post, I don't know who it was, uh, that was writing about the necessity of having military academies. Uh, because they were obviously very expensive, and we have other programs such as ROTC and OCS that produce excellent officers. And I completely agree when I was a cadet. I was like, you know, some of the greatest officers that I've ever met uh, were OCS or ROTC, so why do we need the academy? And it wasn't until I got into the service that I found out that 20% of all my peers were going to be academy grads. And that is the single highest percentage for any school uh, that comes to either a schoolhouse or any units. And so the culture of the academy is what influences the culture out in the army because 20% of whatever group of people uh, you know, you're hanging out with you know, after you graduate are going to be academy grads. Uh, so if you know, everybody likes to drink IPAs at the academy, everybody's going to drink IPAs you know, when you go down to your, your schoolhouse. When you show up to your first army unit or your first uh, assignment, 20% um, you know, of the officers around you are going to be academy grads and they're going to look at you and they're going to say, I know who you are, don't screw it up. You know? and that's always going to keep you um, you know, to, to, to better yourself and understand that you've done four years of this with your classmates when you go out there into the, into the, big, into the big Army, big Air Force, you know, the, the, the guys to your left and right, you know, are going to do the same challenges with you and you know you can do it, it gives you that extra confidence. 
Okay, so what? What's the point of this whole conversation? Obviously, I'm not an expert. I didn't give you anything that was, that, that was crazy, that, was, that you didn't know already. Um, but a lot of times, we have a lot of people uh, you know, present um, you know, bad situations that they found themselves in, right? I was drinking and driving. I got in an accident. And I got my buddies killed. And I wish I could have thought more about uh, what is uh, you know, the, the, the consequence of the importance of not drinking and driving. And it makes you think a little bit. Next time you're drinking and you think about getting in the car, you remember uh, it could be really ugly. You know, that there's, so there's some really bad stuff that can happen. Uh, you, you read the honor cases and you hear about your buddies, you know, who are getting, on, you know, kicked out of the academy for whatever reason, and it makes you think about the honor code one more time. What I want to utilize this opportunity to tell you that the challenges you're going to face as officers could come as soon as seven months, eight months, a year after graduation. You become an A-10 pilot, you become, uh, you know, F-15, F-35, got willing to finish, you know, the project. You're going to be out there making decisions that are going to take uh, a lot of courage. And your values are going to come into place and you better know who you are as a leader. Now, obviously, I wouldn't expect you know, everybody to come out of this, you know, this meeting, and half of you are going to fall asleep and, uh, and have a discussion about this. You know, I wouldn't be flatter. I think it's kind of weird. Um, but I think it's important to, at some point, um, you know, have a conversation about the things that you're going to be doing as an officer. So uh, if you're a cadet, I challenge you, and I recommend that you find an instructor, officer, and NCO related to your branch uh, in the service and have a sit-down conversation with them before you graduate and you explain the plan of who you're trying to be as a platoon leader or as an officer and some of the decisions that you would make in hypothetical scenarios and have a conversation about um, you know, what is it that is expected of you and how are you going to represent the values of the Air Force uh, to complete the mission. And finally, I would say that uh, I'm a very proud uh, Army West Point graduate and uh, it has been very difficult for me to spend the last couple of days uh, at Arrival Academy. <laughs> I've been trying to steal a playbook uh, at night, but it's been, it's been a tough challenge. Um, but I don't want anything but the best of all of you. I would love to have the best Air Force in the entire universe uh, so we can, we can always uh, uh, you know, protect uh, my family and protect all the citizens around me so we can continue to play football on Sundays and, and, and have a free country that we can make our own decisions. I think it's very honorable, everything that you guys are doing. Um, give, give the Air Force a chance, everyone. I mean, I think that everybody gets to that five-year mark and everybody's getting, you know, getting ready to go out. The grass is not greener on the other side. I can promise you, and I'm telling you this, you know, from my house and my contract and my NFL career, that you as millennials are gonna want purpose in life. And nothing's gonna give you as much purpose as wearing a uniform. Nothing's gonna inspire your kids more than coming home every single day after a deployment and uh, being able to see their father or their mother uh, serve the nation the way you guys are going to do. So, very thankful for your service. Thank you so much for having me here. And, uh, and I think we do have some time with some questions. Thank you, sir, for your message, uh, your encouragement, and your commitment to your values is inspiring. So at this time, we do have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, please use the mics up to the right of the stage, and um, I will announce last question when we're running out of time. Nobody's going to ask a question, obviously. It's an academy. <laughs> Nobody wants to be the first one. Yeah. Sir. I'm not the President of the United States. I'm not, I'm not a general, but I've obviously been, you know, I've been to Afghanistan three times and I understand the challenges. Um, you know, what, what are we trying to accomplish in Afghanistan? I think everybody knows what we went through in the first place. Uh, Al-Qaeda had a lot of Taliban training camps, I mean, correction, uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, terrorist camps, and they were, they were harboring terrorists that were getting trained to fight us and, you know, impose their will on the rest of the world. Um, you know, we take care of that pretty easily, and then we found ourselves into a broken nation where we have a lot of challenges, uh, where we have, um, you know, a much, a much more difficult challenge than we, that we thought we were going to walk into. Um, I was not, I'm not going to call myself, but I was 
pass, I mean, I, I had a, you know, an average GPA, I was middle of the class, you know, I was not a rocket scientist. But I was very unprepared to find the challenges that I was going to find, you know. You obviously understand, yeah, they got Pashtuns and they got, you know, Alazai and they got other tribes and whatnot, but how are you going to be able to, to, to effectively leverage one tribe against the other um, to obtain your objectives? It's very difficult, and I don't think we've been able to do that. I don't think we've been able to completely eradicate the Taliban and put the uh, the Afghan National Army or the, Af or the Afghan National Police in power. So right now we have a presence in Afghanistan. I think it's 10,000 troops. And what we're trying to do is keep the lid off on things, right? We have uh, a, lot of, a lot of things flying in the sky that can do a lot of damage, that can scare the Taliban, just like we were scared of IDs. And, uh, and right now things are sort of in a stalemate, you know, case. You know, we have had, had any, any uh, you know, terrors in the news coming out of Afghanistan and, 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 and killing you know, U.S. members. Uh, but at some point, we're going to have to find the, the, the long-term solution. And I went to Walter Reed a couple of days ago, and I was talking to a couple of uh, Green Berets who, who, who were wounded in, in Helmand, you know, lost their legs. Uh, another uh, uh, Ranger uh, uh, NCO that I, that I knew, um, you know, got shot in the arm, and, and you're having a conversations with him about, you know, at what point are we going to, you know, move forward from this, you know, especially... You know, our generation, the millennials, you know, we always ask the question, right? What's in it for me? You know, that's what defines us in everything we do. Sure, you give me all this brief, sure, you tell me all this stuff, but what's in it for me? And right now it's becoming really, really tough to find that. You know, I, 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 we couldn't win the war when we had 120,000 troops, and we're trying to win it with 10,000 troops. It's going to become very difficult. So maybe we're going to have to find, you know, a long term, uh, you know, investment slash challenge to, to be able to stabilize the country and stabilize the region. But I think at some point, maybe all the priorities are going to become more important. We're going to have to, you know, leave Afghanistan, uh, you know, in a really bad place. So it's, it may, my, my boil down to this, you know, you have two bad options, you know, which one you're going to take. And, uh, and obviously, as, a, as, a, as an academy grad and as a you know, former officer, um, I think that uh, the good order and discipline is, is always uh, the most important thing and the thing that has made, you know, our army and our, you know, our, our military the, the greatest force that's ever, you know, uh, been on the, the planet, um, but, uh, but I just hope and pray that our, that our leaders uh, have the wisdom uh, to, to get us out of this one and to, you know, bring our soldiers and bring our, our, our servicemen, you know, back home safe, um, you know, so we can, we can regather and, and approach challenges in the future, maybe with a different outlook. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, Cadet Wilmer, Squadron 18. Uh, so standing in front of millions um, by yourself, your team's in the locker room, must have been nerve-wracking. I was just wondering what was going through your mind in the moments before and during that moment. So it wasn't nerve-wracking. I thought my teammates were to my left and right because we talked about, um, you know, everybody wanted to take a knee. Uh, not everybody. Some players wanted to take a knee. You know, the president made some remarks that infuriated a lot of people down in Alabama. And uh, the first game of the, the, the weekend was the Baltimore game. And, uh, I think that you know most of all the players took a knee during the national anthem. So my teammates, um, you know, a lot of them infuriated. I don't know their, their circumstances. I don't know their positions. I think I've learned a lot about uh, cultures that I was not very familiar with uh, since I've been in the NFL. Uh, you know, when you live in a, you know, I'm not gonna. This is I'm gonna lay it out straight. When you live in a predominantly white environment, you know, you don't really get to listen uh, to the minorities and a lot of voices. When you go into a locker room where now you're the minority, you know, you get to listen a lot, and so it becomes becomes very apparent that there's, a, there's obviously a systematic problem in our country uh, where a lot of people don't wake up you know, as happy as you do every single morning. That's very unfortunate. So for me, you know, the kneeling in the national anthem, um, you know, I, I don't think it's very effective. I don't think nothing has been accomplished. I think people are losing their purpose, but you know, that's not for me to judge if somebody wants to take a knee or not. But I cannot take a knee in the national anthem. So either we all take a knee or we all stand up. And I was the only player that had an issue with taking a knee. So because of that, they decided to stay inside the, the locker room, and I uh, had another issue with standing inside the locker room. I'm at Soldier Field, you know, when I'm running the bus and I'm listening to music, you know, getting ready for the game, you know, I see a soldier in World War II carrying out a soldier, and that's the monument for all of us. That's a monument for every soldier, Marine, and, uh, and airman. Um, and it's, it's very tough, you know, it's very tough to say, okay, I'm gonna stay inside and, and then form part of this protest that, again, just like this mission, I really don't understand. So I asked my teammates if I can go out to the tunnel. They said, yeah, sure, we got the coin toss. We'll be there next to you. But at the end of the day, I wasn't. Um, I think as, I was, as the national anthem was getting ready to start, I looked back, and I found the teammates that were supposed to be with me hesitating 
not to come forward, and then I have to make the decision. Do I go back to the tunnel, or do I stay and listen to the national anthem? And I think, obviously, at that point, you're not going to walk out other than when the national anthem has started. So it's not like I was trying to make a, send a message. I was not trying to be anything or represent the, 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 the views of all the veterans ac across the United States. You know, I was trying to do what was right. Um, you know, I had a group chat the night before, and I was telling my in-laws, and I was telling my, my buddies um, what the team was going to do. And the message was pretty clear. It was like, you better not stay in the, in the locker room. You better find a way to go out there. Um, you know, my brother-in-law was blown up in Warda province. It's been a year, Walter Reed. He was with the quarterback of our team in the back of the truck, and he didn't make it. Um, obviously, I have you know, soldiers that, that died in my arms uh, when I was there in Kandahar. And the only reason why we fought for each other is because we had a, a U.S. flag on our shoulder. So I understand that most of my teammates are never going to understand, you know, what it's, what it's like to be in Zari District and sling bullets for a year, um, you know, under the only reason that, you know, we have a flag and the president of our flag is telling us to do that. And, and we take great honor in that. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, when you get exposed in that situation, it's, uh, it's very difficult to get out of it. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a grenade here on the floor and somebody's got to take the bullet, right? So whether you have to do a press conference afterwards and apologize for you know, for the misunderstanding or for the fact that, um, you know, it was not the plan and, and you exposed, you know, your teammates and your organization because they agreed to stay in, in the tunnel. Um, you know, that's not for me to argue. I just, I try to do the best decision that you would make, that you would make, and that every officer in this room would make. Um, I think it's a very, very difficult situation and, and I, I cannot represent the views of everybody, not of the veterans, not of football players. I cannot represent the values that, that, I, was, that I was raised with. And so try to do my best, but it does not feel right. Obviously, you know, when you see yourself, you know, every morning on Fox News and people are quoting you saying that you are embarrassed to stand up for the national anthem, misquoting you and all your quotes, you know, it feels, feels pretty, um, you know, it feels pretty bad, you know. I don't have a social media account, so I can just, you know, copy, you know, I make a note and retweet it and whatnot. I don't want to get myself involved in the, in the whole process of who's right and who's wrong, you know. My body, you know, my, the soldiers that I serve with, with, my family, they know me, they know what I stand for. Every single time I meet someone, they understand, you know, where I come from. I'm an academy grad just like you. You know, I'm making the same decisions you would have made. Uh, but unfortunately, it was a, um, it was a storm that, that I found myself in the middle of. And, you know, maybe, maybe I did the right thing, maybe I didn't do the right thing, you know, in a lot of senses. But one thing is for sure, I was not going to stay in the locker room. That's for sure. So I went to, uh, I tried to play for the NFL because uh, I wanted to pay for business school. It was very expensive. A lot of you will face the same dilemma when you get out of the Air Force. Even though I'm trying to tell you to stay in, it's unavoidable that 70% of you will get out after five years. Um, and you have to find, you know, how to be competent in, in, the, in the civilian world. And so I, you know, if, well, how am I going to pay for business school? You know, the NFL pays a lot of money for one year. So I decided to go in and try to for the NFL. And uh, the, the experience of training camp is, is very rough because there's a lot of transparency, you know, in the NFL. And if you're an undrafted guy, you have um, half a shot. If you're a first-round pick, you got four years, unlimited shots, you know. And so when you show up, you haven't played the position, uh, you, you're rotating with the third string at practice. I'm getting one rep at practice. I'm looking around the room. There's 12 of us. Only six make it. Four of them are first-round picks, and the other two are fourth-round picks that did just draft this year. I knew in Philadelphia I was going to get cut. So that was challenging. That was really challenging because I got out of the military. I was in the Ranger Regiment, you know, arguably the best unit in the, in, in, in the military. And, uh, and I gave that all up to pursue this, this, this dream of playing in the NFL, which is not a dream at all. It's not that cool. And, um, <laughs> and I failed. For my, first, my first go, I failed. I failed knowing that I was going to fail, which is the worst. It's, you know, you start in training camp knowing that there's no chance that you're going to survive in, in, this, in, this, in this, this cycle of first run pigs, high draft pigs, you know, high free agent signings. Uh, but fortunately, I got a chance to, to sign with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and I got a chance to spend a year in practice squad, and I got a year to you know, mentally prepare myself for a real evaluation at training camp the following year. And then when I went to training camp, it's, it's very similar to, um, it's very similar to all the, 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 the different, you know, I wouldn't call it tough schools, but similar to some of the, you know, special operations, you know, tryouts that you have. I heard some people going to the TAC-B in a couple of weeks or the, the, you know, the JTAG, the control or whatnot. Um, it's psychologically very difficult because you have a bad day of practice and you think you're gonna get cut. And you're talking to your girlfriend or your wife and you're like, uh, I think we gotta pack our bags. I had a really bad preseason game. I don't think we're gonna make it. 
And then the next day you've got to go out to practice and nobody's giving you any feedback whatsoever. And then the end of the day they make the, the, the cuts. And it's kind of like hard knocks, you know, people are, you know, walking around crying, you know, cold in their bags and you just twiddling your thumbs, hopefully, you know, hoping that nobody comes up to you so you can please you, have your playbook. Um, but just like I mentioned in the Army, a lot of people had a lot, to, you know, to do with my success. My coach was awesome, my teammates were awesome, and, um, and I, w I was very lucky in my, in my uh, situation because a lot of people gave me, you know, maybe some more chances uh, than, than, than I deserve, and I was able to, you know, to stay with the team. We have time for one more question. Sir. So, I think like a lot of things in life, we, we, we create this image of, of, of what is it that it takes to be an NFL player. All right, we think we have, you have to be really fast, you have to be really strong, you have to be all these things. Um, and in reality, I think talent, you know, natural talent has, you know, not as much to do with success in football as many people think. Um, I think if you're able to understand the playbook, if you're able to be disciplined, if you're able to listen to your coaches, it takes care of a lot more than what you think. I hate to say this, but the Patriots sort of operate in the same manner. And so when you have somebody that, that, is, that is, is, is maybe obsessed, you know, uh, about success, as, you know, some of, some of the academy grads that they graduate every year and they only want to be number one and they want to be ranked number one and they only dream about being number one in order to admit it, um, I think that, that adds a lot of value uh, because he's a self-determined human being. I don't have, you don't have to push me. You know, you don't have to tell me to watch film. You don't have to tell me to be on time or even be three hours early and get an extra lift because he knows I'm going to do it myself. Like we all would, you know, we all know that it takes a lot of hard work. Sometimes it's dumb hard work, but we're going to do whatever it takes. So you give me a chance. Obviously, I'm 6'10". That helps a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the experience with the Steelers was, was amazing. And I'm very fortunate to be in that organization. It's, it's awesome. I have a lot of respect for Coach Tomlin. And I'm um, very thankful to be there right now. Thank you again. On behalf of the 2018 NCLS participants, the cadet wing, the faculty and staff of the Air Force Academy, we'd like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. Thanks. Thanks.